Because Islam doesn't have a church, doesn't have an ecclesiastical structure, orthodoxy, in other words, what we consider to be acceptable within Islam and what we consider to be not acceptable has always been a subject of self-regulation and self-development by Muslims. Because there is no church and no excommunication procedure, then it is the individual conscience that basically played the regulating role. The risk one plays, one takes, is by, by, by having this sort of egalitarian structure, is the risk that the nature of religion itself, the, ra- the nature of, of what is acceptable within Islam would change. The benefits, of course, is that you don't have a set of people speaking for God, being God. So, basically what developed within Islamic history, that while there was no institution to exclude people from speaking on behalf of Islam, the obligation became imposed upon the teacher. The responsibility became upon the teacher to ensure that in dispersing information, that this information is not abused or misused. In other words, <clears throat> it became the responsibility of the teacher to choose the forum. And there are numerous hadiths attributed to the Prophet making the same point. One of which, for example, says that if you speak to people with something that is not appropriate to their comprehension, it becomes a source of fitna or becomes a source of enticement for them or corruption for them. Another says that a person who teaches a wrong doctrine is responsible for its misapplication till the final day. So if you teach something that is clearly wrong and you did not exercise due diligence in making sure that it is, it is ensuring yourself that it's at least you've, you've made your best effort, then Every time someone does this thing, relying on your opinion, and it is wrong, you incur the sins. This is not unusual for, our, for Islamic discourses, because you know the hadith of the Prophet, whoever sets a positive sunnah, he gets a benefit for that, and whoever sets a negative sunnah, he gets the, the, the sins for that. Uh, what, is, what you probably would have, would have not heard, this same type of idea reported from the Prophet in the context of knowledge. Because Islam has no church, you will find that the Qur'an, that Allah and the Qur'an speaks about prohibiting or, or allowing things in the name of God as imputing a lie to God if it's not done on the basis of knowledge. In other words, if you say something is halal or haram, without a base, the Qur'an speaks of it as kathib ala Allah, as as in fact lying or imputing a lie to God. Consequently, in Islamic discourses also in in the contemporary age, it became sort of a forgotten doctrine. This was considered one of the kabair, one of the major sins. In other words, if you say something is halal or haram, without a base, the Qur'an speaks of it as kathib ala Allah, as, it, as in fact lying or imputing a lie to God. 
consequently, in Islamic discourses, also in the, in the contemporary age, it became sort of a forgotten doctrine. This was considered one of the kabair, one of the major sins, ignorance. In other, wor- in other words, it was considered a kabira for someone to ask you a question. And you have nothing more than the, the most impressionistic information. And yet you feel entirely comfortable to say, well, it's halal, it's haram, whatever. Again, I emphasize, because Islam did not have a church, it became incumbent that the individual Muslim self-regulate, recognizing that the, the, the extreme risk of speaking on behalf of the religion from an unfounded basis. The second prong, which was equal, even more important, is that the teacher, it was the obligation of the teacher to refrain from transmitting knowledge in context in which the teacher becomes convinced that this knowledge will not be employed properly or that those who are responsible and uh, who, those who are acquiring this knowledge are not going to use it properly. Because of this as well, no civilization has produced more books on the requirements, what they co- use, uh, used to call adab hamalat al-ilm, the adab, the mannerisms of acquiring knowledge or transmitting knowledge or the mannerisms of the student, mannerisms of the teacher, more than the Islamic civilization. In fact, it, the two competitors is the Jewish, Jewish discourses and Islamic discourses, which is more probably the Islamic is more simply because they've had a state for longer. But you will find that up to the to the to the I mean, even address how you should sit, how you should talk, what's proper, what's not proper, how you should dress, all in the context of what was considered to be a very divine activity, and that's the activity of acquiring knowledge. Consequently, in my own training, you studied, and as a student, you, it's very much like going to law school. If because you're going to law school, if your family member comes and asks you about illegal doctrine, if you answer and you're caught, then technically you, sh- you would be expelled from the law school and prohibited from ever becoming a member of the bar. Very much like medicine or law or so on, in my training, or in the training of, of jurists generally throughout Islamic history, as a student, you were a student acquiring knowledge, reflecting and discussing within the controlled circumstances of a place for, for education. But you were not allowed to, in any, under any circumstance, pose yourself as a teacher until you become certified, until you passed your examinations, and you receive basically the college degree, the equivalent of your degree, the college degree, or the, the, the certification that says, now you can represent uh, what you are taught. When I came to the United States, I started teaching, taking much discretion in liberalizing these requirements on the basis that Muslims in the United States needed to be informed and so on and so forth. And consequently, my inclination was to simply teach wherever I would be asked to teach and to incorporate all types of students. It was the biggest mistake of my life. It was the biggest mistake because what I have learned that knowledge placed, exactly like medical knowledge placed in someone who's not, does not have the, the, the balance of the doctor or the, um, uh, what's the word, the, the seasoning of a doctor 
or legal knowledge placed in the hands of someone who does not have the meticulous training of a lawyer it will produce havoc and produce much abuse. And my own experience turned out to be exactly that. The, the people I taught, most of them, what they learned actually, I think, in retrospect, ended up hurting them more than helping them. Now, I might be... I might be unfair in this judgment, I don't know, but my inclination is, is that it ended up hurting them more than helping them. More importantly, that they now had the power of information without any real understanding of the information. Consequently, I was extremely hesitant for many years to do anything at all. Uh, starting at Princeton after calling off the halakha I had there uh, I remained a year without doing anything and after arriving in Texas a year without doing anything and then now I'm starting this as you know the first day but I've resolved myself to do it the right way and the right way is to follow the rules for acquiring knowledge and this is what you have here I'll uh, go over it very quickly with you Allah is the all-knowing Allah is described as Alim Alim means all-knowing whenever you have a description of by God like in Mutakabbir for example, or like Al-Ghafoor, Al-Rahim, then that is a zone that God claim, has propriety claims over. That is well known. When God declares a propriety claim, then you must tread in that field carefully. This is the whole idea of, of for example, if you look at the, 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 the 99 sifat, we call them names, but they, they're really more the, the attributes of God, the 99 attributes of God. You will find that in the 99 attributes of God, there's an enormous amount of theology that tells you to tread carefully upon, when you step in this field. One of the, the, the most crucial is this whole field of knowledge because in Islam, what is knowledge? You're either studying ayat, ayat means proof of God, or you're studying the intent of God. That's it. All knowledge in Islam reduces itself either to a proof of God or something relating to the intent of God. And since you are discoursing about God, then one is a question that we often raised in these halakhas and we ask, what if someone is studying mathematics? Does one tread carefully? I mean, is that, is that related to the intent of God? Well, we won't get into all the debates about this, but at a minimum we can say that when, when one is talking about Islamic knowledge, one is talking about the intent of God, the divine intent. What is it that God wants? And consequently becomes the, 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 the necessity of, of or the obligation of being careful so Allah is all knowing knowledge is the essence as well as the attribute of Allah the sifa was that to seek knowledge is to venture in the domain of God this is all a translation from what we normally wrote in these circumstances speaking out of ignorance is equated to imputing lies to God do not, consequently, the Qur'an says, Do not utter from ignorance what your tongues fabricate and say this is lawful and this is forbidden in order to impute lies to God. For those who impute lies to God will not triumph. The, in other words, do not say that certain things are halal or haram um, without basis. The Qur'an also says, Say, have you reflected upon what God has sent you for food? So, in other words, sent food for you of which you have labeled some as lawful and some as forbidden. And ask yourselves, 
Has God permitted this to you? Has God permitted you to declare some of it lawful and some of it forbidden? Or are you imputing lies to God? What do those who invent lies of God think about the day of reckoning? Knowledge is not a right, but a privilege granted by the mercy of Allah to those who accept its responsibility. It is not possible, this is another Quranic verse, it is not possible for all the believers to go out in the way of God all at the same time. So a segment of them must go out in the way of God and seek the knowledge of religion so that they may advise their companions when consulted. Perhaps they may take heed for themselves. Throughout the Islamic civilization, specific rules and procedures have been developed for the attainment and transmission of knowledge. Since there is no church in Islam, one had to rely on the conscience of each individual Muslim not to teach out of ignorance and consequently corrupt the religion of God. Nevertheless, it is the responsibility of each teacher to ensure that his or her teachings are not misused or abused. The key to knowledge is humility. One must presume ignorance in oneself before every issue confronted. Arrogance before knowledge is an affront to God's domain. The overriding principle for both teacher and student is the integrity in the service of knowledge and due diligence, what they used to call al juhd or al qariha. This is a contract, henceforth, this is a contract, aqt, before God, between the mu'allim, in, in these halaqa conditions, you usually call the teacher the mu'allim, and a student a talib, plural tulab, and the tulab undersigned. This contract is sanctified before God through the endorsement, bay'ah, signified by the signature below. The bay'ah is to endorse the following. Being fully aware that I am Allah's viceroy and representative on this earth, Entitled to dignity and bound, again this is translation from the usual type of bay'ah you took. I did, I have to admit, I did omit several things. So out of honesty I, I must tell you that. Being fully aware that I am Allah's viceroy and representative on this earth, entitled to dignity and bound to give dignity to others, I give my endorsement in the name of Allah the most merciful and the most compassionate, and in accordance with the sunnah of his prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, to the provisions listed below. One, I pledge to seek the way to knowledge and seek the enlightenment of knowledge. Two, I pledge not to speak out of ignorance and not to issue advice without reflection and investigation. I pledge myself to the jihad against the self, ignorance and injustice. I pledge to seek to understand the command to enjoin the good and forbid the evil and to comprehend the balance. al mizan. I pledge to refrain from judgment without diligent investigation and to avoid conceit or argumentation, understanding my duty to seek enlightenment and clarification. I pledge not to use information obtained during the halakha for the purpose of instruction without prior certification or authorization. From the mu'allim mentioned above, I pledge to be respectful of my fellow tulab and to exhibit the necessary respect due to knowledge and due to the mu'allim mentioned above. I pledge to attend all the halakha sessions, to reflect upon the knowledge transmitted and to digest it in the jihad against the self. In other words, that's where this knowledge should go first. Jihad against the self, not jihad against others or for others. I pledge to attend... Oh, I did that. Under all circumstances, I pledge to obey Allah before all else and to carry myself in a dignified and honorable fashion. Dignified, honorable fashion, that means if you're late, you don't run to the halaqa, if, I mean, these are all things that used to matter a lot, uh, that you don't chew gum uh, during the halaqa, you don't chew tobacco, uh, you don't bring, come in with your hubbly bubblies, um, you don't decide to, uh, I don't know, um, clean your nails, all of that is considered things, I mean, I, you could ask me if things come up, <coughs> you don't yell before the halakha, like on your way to the halakha, you get pissed off about something, you start yelling, that's again, would be a violation. Or after the halakha, you feel like you're in a bad mood, you start backbiting, or fight, that's also would be a violation, things like that. It is understood that the failure to comply with the above commitments imposes upon me the obligation to disqualify myself from the halakha. Or alternatively, the mu'allim may disqual disqualify me. Now, of course, the only way I can know is for you to come and tell me. I mean, there's really no other way that I would know. 
So this does impose upon you an obligation that if you do violate or you suspect that you violate, you either disqualify yourself or you come and ask me if this in fact disqualifies you. The protocol, although it is not part of the rules, the protocol followed is that usually two violations are permitted. On the third, disqualification comes. Disqual- disqualification means that you do not attend uh, the halakha. Okay, you, can, you may take it home, reflect on it. If you want to sign it, then um, you may sign it and you come next halakha. If, if not, then, you know, this is not an issue of blame, uh, of good or bad. Uh, it's an issue of whether this is the method by which you want to seek knowledge or not. Now, as you noticed, in each pledge, there's a lot of indefiniteness. Because the majority of which is really left up to you. There's nothing other than you and God who knows the answer to this. For example... I pledge to seek the way to knowledge. There is no way that I or anyone can tell you whether in fact you are truly seeking the way of knowledge. It's only you who can tell yourself that and God. I pledge myself to jihad against the self and ignorance and injustice. Again, it's only you who can define that. I pledge to understand the command to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Again, it's only you who can define that or understand that. In other words, these are all things that simply put you on notice before God. But do not come to me and say, Oh, I think last night I got an opportunity to read a book on enjoining the good and forbidding the evil, and I didn't, and I'm worried that I violated the pledge. It doesn't work that way. The part that really concerns me as a teacher is if you posed yourself using the information you learned in this halakha. I don't care about information you obtained from elsewhere. The information you obtained from this halakha, you used to teach. You, as students, I do not accept you in a position as teachers. And it must be understood from the beginning that that's how it's going to be. If you violate it, then you would be under an obligation of conscience to inform me and uh, give me the option to take action. If you want to understand it, just think of it as medical school or law school, in terms of more like a professional school. Um, You should not, as a student, give advice to your, your father comes to you and he says, you know, I have really some sharp chest pains. And you say, you know, I'm third year medical school, let me tell you, go do, take this and this and this. That's, that's against the code. Uh, and, you, and you then should not be a doctor. Um, the best you can do is say, well, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this. You really need to see a doctor. And the same was in the field of law. That's the point that, that all this training in Islamic law or not Islamic, but Islamic knowledge, because we do not have a church emphasizing.